to lose, March 1969. After years of development work and months of delay, Concorde is about to take off for the first time. Just seconds to go. Et maintenant, enfin, le premier vol. 110 tons of aircraft, all up weight there. The magic moment with us. The crescendo of sound from the 593 Olympus is. Roblaniac Airport, ici Concorde. She rose. Ce premier vol que vous tous allez voir maintenant en direct. Le voilà. 45 knots, 90. 135. Nose come up to 20 degrees. She's airborne. She flies. Concorde flies. But Concorde was not the world's first supersonic passenger jet to fly. She'd been beaten into the air by her Soviet rival. For the first time, secret history will tell the story of the Cold War race for supersonic supremacy. A battle fought in the sky by the world's top aircraft designers. And on the ground by secret agents working for the East and for the West. A battle which was to take its toll in lives when the Russian Concorde crashed in 1973 at the Paris Air Show in what we will reveal to be extraordinary circumstances. The race to build the world's first supersonic passenger jet began in 1961 when President Khrushchev, flushed with success from recent triumphs in the space race, heard news reports of early development work on Concorde. Good progress is being made on the Concorde supersonic airliner. The BAC works at Filton near Bristol is the British design and manufacturing centre for the Concorde. Он бы отстал от Запада, но а, в Советском Союзе никогда не было принято. Поэтому если Запад уходит вперед, его отпускать нельзя. Его надо не отпускать, а надо с ним конкурировать и, если даже можно, в этом направлении обойти. Такая была нам поставлена задача Хрущев. Deep in the heart of the Soviet Union, senior engineers from the Tupolev Design Bureau met in secret. Design blueprints for a Russian Concorde, called the TU-144, were drafted and discussed. Khrushchev had appointed his favorite aircraft engineer, Andrei Tupolev, as the chief designer. In the race to build the world's first supersonic passenger jet, international prestige was not the only thing at stake. The market for supersonic travel was estimated to be worth billions of dollars. In gunning for these rich prizes, the Russians lagged a long way behind the Concorde team. I would say it's a rough estimate, maybe two years, three years. But further behind, in some areas than others. They never closed the gap in engines because Stalin had decreed that uh, computers were non-Marxist scientists, a science. They never caught up with this in electronics. When it comes down to civil aircraft, airliners, they were at a great handicap because their main experience of airplanes was building aircraft for war. For Khrushchev and the powers in the Kremlin, there was only one way to catch up. They needed to get hold of Concorde's blueprints. The Soviet Union would have to cheat to win. In the spring of 1963, Khrushchev instructed his vast espionage network to gather as much information as possible on Concorde's airframe and engines. There were lists of different things 
for their people in the West to find. Uh, exchange students, for example, uh, helped pay their uh, scholarship in the West by leafing through open source magazines. The information was brought back into Russia. There was a kind of a central collection agency uh, that got all this material together. This army of about 10,000 grubs going through this very turgid, very, very sensitive, uh, hard to understand technical material. In France, the Russians recruited secret agents. Their mission, to penetrate Concorde's factories. The DST, the French intelligence service, was caught off guard. Et pendant un certain temps, le, les responsables économiques français, que ce soit des, des recherches de pointe ou, ou les centres de recherche, n'avaient pas conscience des dangers que nous courions et du nombre d'agents qui, sur notre territoire, passaient leur temps à essayer de nous voler ces secrets. Within months of Khrushchev's order, Concorde secrets were heading east on the Ostend to Warsaw Express. As French counterintelligence were to discover in a later surveillance operation, Russian agents transferred the intelligence to microfilm. Then the couriers hid it behind grills, in towel dispensers, and in waste paper bins, cigar tins, and toothpaste tubes. The secrets came from the very heart of Concorde's factories in France. It wasn't until the beginning of 1964 that the West woke up to the threat posed by Soviet penetration. The DST sounded the alarm. La DST a pris des contacts avec les chambres de commerce, avec les syndicats patronaux, avec les amicales patronales pour leur donner des informations, pour les mettre en garde et pour leur dire qu'ils ne devaient pas hésiter à s'adresser au service de sensibilisation de la DST lorsqu'ils avaient un problème ou lorsqu'ils avaient une inquiétude. The DST had itself been warned. Acting on a tip-off from MI6 and the CIA that Sergei Pavlov, chief of Aeroflot in Paris, was in fact a Soviet secret agent, they placed him under surveillance. Pierre Levejois was one of the DST's agents assigned to watch Pavlov. Sa profession de sa profession supposée de directeur de l'Aeroflot à Paris lui permettait d'approcher normalement tous les milieux aéronautiques toutes les compagnies aériennes et de créer des liens, bien entendu, avec Pierre ou Paul, d'une compagnie aérienne ou peut-être d'un euh, organisme qui a à sa disposition euh, des documents techniques euh, particuliers, qui les a normalement pour son travail. À tous les heures, jour ou nuit, Levejois et son team de watchers tracked Sergei Pavlov through Paris. On suit, on écoute, et petit à petit, on recueille des éléments qui prouvent que on est sur la bonne voie ou qui prouvent qu'on est sur la mauvaise voie. L'espion soviétique ne brusque jamais les choses. Il est très psychologue, il a sûrement fait des études pour ça. On dispose de plusieurs fonctionnaires dans des situations normales aux alentours, qui ne bougent pas. L'apparition des femmes dans le service a beaucoup aidé dans ce domaine, parce qu'on a l'air moins bête avec une fille au bras que d'être tout seul. Et, et bien, on constate simplement. On one of his forays, Pavlov approached an airport worker at Le Bourget to obtain tire scrapings off the runway from Concorde testbed aircraft. With his guilt established, the DST played cat and mouse. They used the unsuspecting Pavlov to confuse the Russians. They fed him false intelligence. They, they brewed up in their laboratories, apparently, this, this marvelous rubber compound, something like bubble gum, uh, previously unknown in the annals of industrial chemistry. 
and gave this uh, to the Frenchman to pass on to his Soviet contact. And I've always had this picture of these poor Soviets out there in the steppes trying to reproduce this bubble gum and to try to turn it into large tires for their SST and completely failing and uh, being rather severely punished by their administrators and the entire system for their inability to make this stuff work. Pavlov had served his purpose for the DST. It was time to spring a trap. On the 1st of February 1965, he was due to meet a contact for lunch at La Flambe, a restaurant in the center of Paris. Et le restaurant euh, a été euh, surveillé par moi-même avec une euh, dactylo du service la, la plus sexy possible. Hélas, il n'y avait pas des tonnes de choix, mais enfin, on a quand même fait un tri. Et Pavlov est arrivé avec euh, la personne euh, dont je ne dis pas le nom. Euh, et comme par hasard, il s'est assis euh, à la table à côté de la mienne, juste en face de moi. Il a demandé une banane flambée. Et en français, c'est un, un jeu de mots. J'ai dit avec un air très amoureux à ma secrétaire dans l'oreille que il n'y a pas seulement la banane qui serait flambée dans 10 minutes. After a two-hour lunch, Pavlov asked for the bill. It was the signal for the DST agents on the blocked-off streets outside to move in. Il s'était intéressé au Concorde. On a trouvé d'ailleurs dans sa serviette euh, les plans du train d'atterrissage du Concorde. To avoid diplomatic embarrassment, the French deported Pavlov. On his return to Moscow, he became deputy minister of civil aviation. But in France, the Russians had many strings to their bow. Smug with success after netting Pavlov, the DST were not aware that another Soviet agent was operating undercover. His activities would not be discovered until it was far too late. The agent's name was Sergei Fabiev. In the drive to gather Concorde intelligence, he was Moscow's most powerful weapon. Well, Fabiev c'était a, a Français d'origine uh, russe, donc à l'époque d'origine soviétique. Uh, c'était un ingénieur, et qui finalement uh, a été uh, contacté par. Uh, an officier traitant des, du GRU, Service de Renseignement Militaire, et qui avait constitué un véritable réseau d'espionnage au bénéfice du GRU. For 15 years, undetected by the DST, Sergei Fabiev supplied thousands of pages of technical documents to his Soviet controllers, gleaned from his network of communist sympathizers and paid informants within the French aviation industry. Et il a été arrêté en 1977. Et euh, finalement, assez rapidement, une fois euh, entre les mains des, des services de la DST, il a fini par euh, fournir, coopérer dans une certaine mesure au cours de ses interrogatoires. Sergei Fabiev had been blown by a Soviet defector. In return for a reduction in his prison sentence under interrogation at DST headquarters, the devastating value of the secrets he'd passed to Russia became apparent. Car les agents qui se trouvent sur notre territoire correspondaient avec le, la centrale au service duquel il s'était placé parce qu'on appelait des espèces d'émissions flash. The DST intercepted these messages and stored them in their archive. But without knowing Fabiev's transmission code, they couldn't decipher them. During his interrogation, Fabiev revealed his secret code, enabling the French to read the stored messages. The French, I understand, brought somebody back from retirement to work through this mountain of Russian language material. And in it, they found the uh, congratulations from Moscow for making off with the entire set of blueprints for the Concorde prototype. By the beginning of 1968, with the help of espionage agents like Sergei Fabiev, the Soviets had managed to catch up with Concorde. The shape of the Soviet plane was still a closely guarded secret. True to Khrushchev's orders, they were now poised 
to overtake the West. By the summer of 1968, the Soviet prototype was almost ready to fly. We knew that the flight of Concord was mentioned in March, February 1969. И мы поэтому знали точно, что мы должны взлететь в 68-м. As 1968 drew to a close, the Russians pulled out all the stops. Как раз дни, которые мы проводили перед первым вылетом, это была очень напряженная работа. Я лично не выходил с нашей летной испытательной базы в течение семи дней. У меня были, так сказать, ну, сроки работы иногда до 48 часов. On the 31st of December 1968, from the dark confines of its secret hangar, the TU-144 emerged for its first flight. Its extraordinary resemblance to Concorde was immediately apparent. There was no public announcement. If anything went wrong, the Soviets could deny the flight had ever taken place. A small crowd of people, including Andrei Tuplev and his son Alexei, gathered on the runway to watch. I felt good. My father felt good. My father felt good. Он был уверен, уверен, что в первом полете ничего не произойдет. Это передавалось нам, непосредственным исполнителям его воли. The TU-144 made three passes over the airfield. It had beaten Concorde into the air by just three months. the first just when you run on the sprint if you win one tenth of second you'll be world champion so that's we are first in the world supersonic passenger first the Soviets flashed pictures of their triumph around the world. Western designers were appalled by the resemblance to Concorde. The media were quick to name it Konkordsky. I mean, it, it was one of the most um, classic examples of industrial espionage in the history of modern aviation. On Concorde, we tested something like 200 different shapes before we decided on the final shape uh, that was needed for the aeroplane. They certainly took advantage of all the preliminary work that we had done, and it doesn't half help if somebody else has done all the hard work for you. It was a Chinese copy of Concorde. And I have to say, uh, even uh, from a superficial look, not a very good Chinese copy, because I think they'd made a number of fundamental mistakes. While GRU agent Sergei Fabiev had supplied the Soviets with the entire technical documentation for the Concorde prototype, the Russians were not able to make an exact copy from the plans. It's very difficult to make copy. Dif different system in drawing, different system in measurement. Different, different system in technology, different nuts, different uh, bolts, 
screws, and so on and so on. It's, uh, you cannot use it. They did not, did not copy slavishly. They would do shunt engineering. They would go around the things that they could not do or could not copy. You don't need to make copy. You may have a sample. You may steal it. You may uh, find it from the wreckage. If you have a sample, you have a characteristics. You, if you make the thing with similar characteristics, it looks and uh, must be similar. But Concorde's wing was a highly sophisticated piece of engineering with curved edges crucial for its successful flight through enormous speed ranges. In attempting to match the characteristics of Concorde's wing, the Russians got their wing wrong. That shape was totally new and Concorde's worked and theirs didn't. In what way did theirs not work? Because it didn't create the anticipated lift and stability throughout the speed range. If you take an ordinary airplane wing, if the airplane uh, is at too high an angle, then the flow of the wing breaks down, and it breaks down in an uncontrollable fashion, and the airplane literally falls out of the sky. On Concorde, what we found, and it was partly good luck, but a great deal of it, good judgment and knowledge of what happens to airflows, was that with that very narrow wing and the swelling out to the back, we created a, a large vortex over the top of the wing, and it produced a great deal of lift over the wing. And that is why Concorde lands at such a high angle. It, it lands at such a high angle in order to generate this vortex. And that's why you need the drooping nose so that the pilot can see out. The great secret of Concorde, there are two great secrets. One is this um, combination of a very slender, very narrow wing at the front end and this wider wing at the back combined with the vortex meant that we had a wing design which would be efficient at supersonic speeds and could be safely landed on existing airfields. In failing to achieve the necessary lift through the speed range with the wing on their prototype, the Russians had no option but to go back to their drawing boards and start again. While Tupolev and his team redesigned and rebuilt their prototype, Concorde, in a series of photo opportunities and test flights, showed off to the world. This was the first time two Concords had appeared together. second timing of the display and the immaculate flying by the two crews aroused immense enthusiasm. Five years after Konkortsky's first flight, a completely redesigned TU-144 was now ready for its first appearance in the West. As a solution to the problem of lift across the speed range, the Soviets had come up with a design feature which owed nothing to Concorde. Canard or moustache, two little insect wings behind the cockpit. Konkordsky was now ready to take on Concorde. The new plane made its first appearance in the West at the 1973 Paris Air Show. There was earnest consternation at the FAA in Washington. Are the Russians going to run away with the supersonic transport market? Uh, they claimed it was faster. They claimed it was clean and quiet. It was a very impressive aircraft. We took it very seriously. The competition between two airplanes was very well founded. I mean, they were both supersonic airliners. They were both, in 1973, both hoping to go into service, both hoping to carry passengers in large numbers. The TU-144 was a larger airplane, carried more, and the world at that time didn't know which was going to be the better one. Like two supersonic gladiators, they would now battle it out in the sky. On the third day of the show, Concorde flew first. 
the Paris Air Show in 73, I'd, I'd sort of likened to a coming out ball. You know, we had the, the two uh, highly prepared print young debutantes coming onto the world stage. It was a, a crucial time for the, for the French and the British. This was a symbol of Anglo-French cooperation with, with very dramatic political overtones, the sense that we are entering the EEC, the French are embracing the British. Um, there's just a great deal of interest and excitement. Konkordski was scheduled to fly directly after Concorde. As it taxied for takeoff, the Russian pilot Koslov was told by the French air traffic controllers that his display time had been cut in half. The French, in my opinion, uh, intervened into a scientific technical spectacle for political reasons. This was a major piece of French prestige and honor. I think they simply wanted to showcase their bird. They wanted to show it off to the world and to push the Russians in the background. Andre Turkar and his chief mechanic watched the TU-144's display. We have seen de très près toute l'évolution, toute la présentation de l'avion, qui, je dois dire, a été très bien faite. En particulier, un virage de 360 degrés au-dessus de la piste, à bonne inclinaison, qui était d'une régularité parfaite. Après ce dernier passage, euh, ils ont fait une montée assez forte, mais très raisonnable. John Farley and his co-pilot Andy Jones were also watching. Because there was no cloud, he could go up and up and up, and uh, I don't know, three and a half, four thousand feet, this thing was just going up, looking at it as we were, you know, going away from us like this. And then suddenly, it just very abruptly leveled off. I mean, really violently. And it is something that you never see big aeroplanes do, really violently change their pitch attitude. And both Andy and I went, oh. You've got this vision of this aircraft coming down, and it has to do with the angle, the speed, and the distance remaining when you think, that's not right. And I said to Andy, he's lost it. And at that point, with the aircraft still fairly well up, probably, I don't know, 1,500 feet or a bit less, it started to break up and, and had clearly been overstressed. Six Soviet crew members and eight French citizens died. One little boy playing in front of his home was decapitated by a piece of flying debris. Two other children were also killed. Sa maison, elle est ativoisée, hein? Ah, mes enfants, ils étaient sur le talus. Et puis, j'avais mon autre petite fille qui était dans la maison. J'en ai trois qui étaient sur le talus. Ils sont blessés. J'ai ma belle-fille qui est blessée, mon, mon, mon petit garçon qui est blessé, puis ma, puis mon, ma belle-fille. <laughs> 60 people were seriously injured and 15 houses totally destroyed. They did not come clean. Um, to this day, there has not been a full explanation of what really happened, at least from government sources. It is my view that the Soviets and the French authorities cut a deal. In part three, for the first time, secret history will reveal what really caused Konkordsky to fall out of the sky on Goussainville. One year after Konkortsky crashed at Le Bourget, the French and Soviet governments issued a surprisingly short statement. They concluded that it was impossible to determine what had caused the plane to crash. To this day, the Commission of Inquiry's report into the accident remains secret. Among other mysteries, the black box had apparently been destroyed in the accident. I've never heard of a black box being destroyed. You have an aircraft that has broken up in the sky. And, and it's just like throwing things out from a thousand feet up. They just fall down. It's not like the aircraft plunging in one piece at 400 miles an hour straight into the ground, you know, when you, you could believe that recorders and so on get badly damaged in the bottom of the crater. 
Nearly 25 years after the event, it's now possible to reveal what caused the TU-144 to crash on Cousinville. Minutes before Concorde and the TU-144 were scheduled to fly, a French Army Mirage took off on a covert reconnaissance mission. A surprising departure since at international air shows, competing pilots expect to have the skies to themselves. The regulations state that an 8,000 meter column of airspace must be kept free for their display. Concorde's crew were warned that the Mirage would be flying during its demonstration. We asked Jean Forestier, president of the Commission of Inquiry into the accident, if the same courtesy had been extended to Concordsky's crew. No. Bon, écoutez. On est en train d'aller ailleurs. Si c'est ça, on va faire un tour d'éléments absolument impossible. Bon, écoutez. Moi, c'est très clair. La conversation a pris un tour tel que je vous prie de tenir tout ceci pour nous, les non avenus, et que je m'en vais. C'est clair. Bon, alors c'est fini. C est, c est, c est, non, non, mais c'est fini, puis c'est tout. Monsieur Forestier, c'est très important pour nous que nous... Oui, ben c'est très important pour vous. Vie. Vous mettrez ce que vous voudrez dans votre film, mais vous ne m'y mettrez pas. C'est clair. Bon, où est mon imperméable Jean Forestier's remarkable revelation that the Soviet crew were not warned of the mirage was excluded from the government's statement. The French were embarrassed to admit this breach of international airshow regulations because the Mirage was in fact on a clandestine mission to photograph the TU-144 during its display. In particular, they wanted detailed film of the canards, the insect wings behind the cockpit. Subsequently, a similar wing design was used on French military aircraft. Flying at a height of approximately 4,000 feet, in and out of the cloud, the Mirage tracked the TU-144 through its routine. As the Soviet plane climbed on a trajectory which would cross the Mirage's flight path, the pilot, Koslov, was not aware that it was flying directly above him. Ту-144, понять, в каком направлении он шел, то есть на них или от них они не могли. To avoid colliding with the Mirage, Koslov was forced to take drastic action. He pitched the plane violently downwards, causing gravitational forces of minus 1 g, known in pilot's jargon as a bunt. And we talked to the Russian ground crew immediately after the accident, and they all said, as did a, a Rolls Royce chap who was familiar with their engine. Uh, they all said, well, the engines would not have taken that bunt. Now, what they meant by that was that it, compressors would probably have surged. And this means that you lose thrust. Um, the, the rotating machinery at the front of the engine, which is generating the pressure before it gets to the combustion chamber where you burn the fuel, that will have stalled. It's purely aerodynamic, and it would have stalled. So he had one, two, maybe even all three or four of his engines misbehaving now, so he's level. And you can almost see the question mark over the top of the aeroplane, you know, as it's going along level. At a height of 4,000 feet, Koslov had just one option, to put the plane into a steep kamikaze dive in an attempt to windmill start his engines. So he's got to lower the nose, quickly get some speed up, get these engines blowing around, and then go through a few checklists, turn on the, turn on the fuel, turn on the ignition, and so on. And I suspect that he did this and was completely preoccupied with it, probably got one, two, maybe even all of them going again, and suddenly thought, oh, look at the height, you see. Kozlov clearly virtually recovered the aeroplane, but in so doing, which would have meant pulling back on the stick in this instance, he overstressed the aeroplane to such an extent that there was a structural failure. Secret history's investigations have revealed that the French and Soviet governments colluded to cover up the cause of the crash. With eight French citizens killed on the ground, the French government did not want the world to know that the Mirage jet, in the course of its covert mission, was the precipitating cause of the accident. 
The official statement failed to explain why the Mirage was flying in the Tu-144's airspace. Claiming there was no real risk of a collision between the two aircraft, it implied human error on the part of the Soviet pilot. Jean Forestier returned to defend the statement. Le communiqué officiel, excusez-moi, et je reprendrai les termes du communiqué officiel, parce que je n'ai pas envie de m'égarer. Il est... Bien que l'enquête ait établi qu'il n'existait aucun risque réel de collision entre les deux appareils, le pilote soviétique est susceptible d'avoir été surpris. But the official statement concealed crucial evidence which proved that far from overreacting, the Soviet pilot was forced to take evasive action. Kripiansky, a member of the Russian accident investigation team, has agreed to break ranks. Ну, комиссии ведь как обычно происходят аварийные комиссии, собирают все останки, пытаются выкладывать самолёт, ну, по на какой-то площадке понять, где произошло разрушение, как оно происходило. Вот мы этим вопросом занимались. А параллельно, значит, занималась другая комиссия лётная, и там были представлены фотографии с миража. Потом было радиолокационное поле представлено. Там тоже было видно сближение. In Moscow, the authorities also had reason to collaborate in a cover-up. The Tu-144 had suffered a system failure at the top of its dive at minus 1G and structural failure at the bottom of its dive at 5G. Its rival would have survived a similar maneuver. In the, in the case of Concorde, the limits were in the positive G sense, uh, five plus a margin, which I think brought it nearly up to seven. And certainly it was uh, minus one G and a bit. And all the structure and the systems were designed within that uh, parameter of, of G. Behind the scenes, the Russians agreed to spare the French the embarrassment of blowing the whistle on the Mirage's covert mission providing the French agreed to keep Konkortsky's reputation intact by stating there was nothing wrong with the technical functioning of the aeroplane. Alexei Tupolev was the Soviet head of the Commission of Inquiry. We suggested to him that the French and the Russians colluded to cover up the true cause of the crash. No, Rather than revealing the true cause of the crash, the government statement claimed that a fourth man, flight engineer Benderov, was filming in the cockpit on behalf of a French television crew and speculated that he was to blame. The French and the Russians are still sticking to their story today. Когда экипаж резко отдал колонку от себя, а Бендеров полетел вверх в потолок, она выпала из рук и попала между колонкой, колонкой и полом кабины. C'est que dans le Tupolev 144, virgule, et probablement dans un certain nombre d'autres Tupolev à l'époque, virgule, il existe au pied du manche un creux énorme, un réceptacle qui permet éventuellement à une caméra ou à toute autre chose de venir coincer le manche en position plein piqué. The official statement suggested that with the control column blocked, the pilot could not pull the plane out of its dive. As proof of this theory, it claimed that Benderov's body was found in the cockpit. Il est certain que à la fin, il y a quatre cadavres là où il n'y a que trois sièges. Il y a donc un homme non attaché dans la cabine au moment critique. But those on the scene at the time deny this. We tracked down the fireman who pulled the bodies of the air crew from the wreckage. Alors le, le cockpit se situait de l'autre côté de la, de la rue. Euh, et on a retrouvé le tableau de bord, le cockpit et les pilotes au même endroit, c'est-à-dire dans les décombres du pavillon. 
Je dis c'est que, que les morceaux hein, qu'on a vus, hein. même euh, au niveau des pilotes, euh, ils n'étaient plus, euh, ils étaient plus entiers, hein. euh, que si vous voulez, pour, pour vous donner une image, c'est un pavillon avec un étage mmh. qui existait. Hein. Et euh, on a retrouvé tout le cockpit et les corps des, des pilotes dans la cave. Donc il a écrasé complètement la, le pavillon et tout s'est retrouvé en sous-sol. Il y avait combien de corps donc, euh... Ils étaient trois. Trois dans le pavillon. Il a fallu sortir. Oui. Vous êtes bien sûr qu'il n'y avait pas un quatrième corps Lorsque euh, on a sorti les corps, euh, on en a sorti trois. Euh, je ne voudrais pas vous rappeler euh, la manière dont peut être un corps quand il a reçu des, des tonnes de béton sur lui. Hein. Euh, maintenant, les totaliser, vous dire qu'il y en avait quatre, qu'il y en avait cinq. Euh, moi, je, personnellement, je peux vous dire que j'en ai sorti trois parce que j'étais là. Such clear recollections flatly contradict the government's version. In particular, their hypothesis that Benderoff and his camera were responsible for the accident. During an uncomfortable interview, Jean Forestier finally admitted that high-level political considerations influenced the wording of the government statement. Il y avait des groupes à un niveau nettement supérieur au mien de relations entre les autorités françaises et les autorités soviétiques qui opéraient donc à un niveau qui n'avait rien à voir avec une commission d'enquête technique cherchant paisiblement à faire le tour technique d'un accident. In the race to enter commercial service, as the Russians struggled to come to terms with what had happened at the Paris air show, for the time being, the field was clear for Concorde. Back in 1967, when the plane was first rolled out, the British and French were supremely confident that over 200 Concords would be sold to the world's airlines. Ceremony, the majority of the Concorde customer airlines were represented by senior captains and stewardesses. Options taken on Concords by the world's major airlines represent a potential sales value of hundreds of millions of pounds. Supersonic stewardesses in their varied and colourful uniforms. Most spectators agreed that this too was a beautiful sight. But this, of course, is what they'd really come to see, the Concorde. By 1973, the world's major airlines had not taken up their options to buy. Concorde was forced to go scouting around the world to drum up business. Here at Tehran, the passengers are headed by His Imperial Majesty the Shah and Shah of Iran, who had previously stated his country's interest in Concorde. Even at twice the speed of sound, there isn't a tremor to shake the composure or the hand of the supersonic steward. But neither the Shah nor the major world airlines bought the plane. Concorde took a long time to develop. I mean, the development of a subsonic aircraft is perhaps two, two and a half years. Concorde took 11 or 12 years. And the world changed in that time. With the introduction of the 747, the mass market was where the big money was to be made, not from the jet set in a plane burdened by sonic booms. The environmental lobby became much stronger than it was in the 1950s, particularly in relation to sonic booms. And once uh, it had been decided that the aircraft could not fly supersonically, even over desert lands, then that reduced an enormous slice of the market. Despite original projections of over 200 Concords, just 16 were built. The calculations that had been made on the profitability of Concorde simply went out of the window, so that one was left in the end with the two uh, national airlines as the only customers for the airplane. Konkordsky's future was even more uncertain. Andrei Tupolev did not live to see his plane crash at Paris. He died in 1972. Despite efforts to exonerate his plane from blame, to the powers in the Kremlin, its image had been tarnished. No longer the proud symbol of Soviet scientific endeavor, Konkortsky's commercial service was confined to domestic flights. But his team remained loyal. I can say that in the whole range of parameters, 
Туса 44, он превосходит Конкорд. Мое мнение таково, что самолет в силу своего создания в этот период, времени, он опередил возможности страны, ну если не на 10, то на 15 даже лет. At the end of the 1970s, after just 103 passenger-carrying flights, Konkortsky was withdrawn from commercial service. The political will had gone, and it was too expensive to run. Of the 17 planes built, three survived for military flight tests. The rest became museum exhibits, rusting relics of the supersonic age. But earlier this year, in a twist resonant with irony, Konkordsky, a supersonic phoenix, rose from the ashes. This is truly an historic occasion, being able to share our joy in this remarkable aircraft provides visible evidence of a new period of cooperation in aeronautics between Russia and the United States. American choose our 144 for flying laboratory for the second generation SST because we can fly faster, we can fly Higher. Well, the purpose of the project is to get technical data actually from in-flight measurements on an actual supersonic transport, very large supersonic transport. So we can drill holes in it and put in pressure taps, uh, acoustic microphones, all of those kind of things. To go ahead and develop a supersonic transport of the next generation will require an investment of over 20 billion U.S. dollars. Before anybody's willing to make that kind of an investment, they have to be very confident that the airplane that comes out of that is going to be successful. And by that we mean fares very close to subsonic fare levels. I mean, it's a 300 passenger airplane. It has to have range enough to go across the Pacific as opposed to just across the Atlantic, because that's where the big market growth is. And has to do it and be environmentally compatible so that the noise levels are as quiet as today's subsonic airplanes, uh, so that the emissions do not destroy any ozone, and so that sonic boom is restricted to only to overwater operations. In the new race to build a second generation supersonic passenger jet, the Eagle and the Bear are united against Europe. Britain and France have also designed a Son of Concord. But the Russians and the Americans are off the mark first. The problem is money. It would be hugely expensive. It would have to be bigger than Concorde to be uh, successful. Neither the British or the French governments could afford to take a major part in this program. Uh, and it's questionable whether private finance could provide the amounts of money needed. What we've got to strive for in this country is for somebody to wake up and put some money into the, into the project. Otherwise, you know, we'd be lucky if we get the nose wheel. While the British and the French await funding, the Americans and the Russians are steaming ahead in the next phase of the supersonic age. The newly rebuilt Tupolev 144, part product of the Soviet Union's vast espionage networks and the victim of French intrigue, is now fully kitted out with American flight test equipment. Within weeks, Konkordsky will fly again.